Uh, this, let me say a few words about this slide before I go on with the lecture. Uh, this slide, uh, this is a map that was built up over a period of time. Uh, I'm sorry, both uh, uh, Ken and I are, are guilty of um, the worst of luck. We both have uh, pointers. We both thought we had them with us, and <laughs> we both forgot. Okay. The first part of this map is one that was made uh, in the 1940s by an anthropologist named Paul Kirchhoff. And this line here is the northern extent of Mesoamerican culture. It happened hundreds of years before the Spaniards came. When the Spaniards came, the culture was much, much further uh, to the south, the, the northern border was. Then on that map in the 1980s, uh, Randy McGuire and associates uh, put on some more things, including the stuff about uh, uh, the Rio Grande Pueblos and all. And then in, the, in 1999, in a book uh, called The Casas Grandes World, which was edited by my colleague uh, Kurt Schafsmann and myself, we added what we thought was the Casas Grandes world, which was right here, and we also added uh, what I considered something called the Sonoran Statelets, uh, which I considered to exist out here in northeastern Sonora. Getting a little blinded here, going back and forth. Uh, now, with this map in mind, even before World War II, there, the concept of the prehistoric Southwest began to crystallize around two very differing views. The first of these, and the one I was taught right after the Second World War, and believed in quite uncritically for a while, was um, that of an essentially autonomous or autochthonous that is grown from the soil, Southwest. By the 1920s, there had developed something called the San Juan Hypothesis, which was an idea presented by A.V. Kidder, the archaeologist of Pecos Pueblo fame. According to this concept, after the introduction of maize and squash, and a bit later on, beans, from somewhere in Mexico at some time in the past, neither really known, uh, the American Southwest developed pretty much autonomously. It was cut off from contact with Mexico. It developed on its own. According to this concept, then, the most vibrant center and the, and the uh, one that really ran the others was one called the basket maker Pueblo or Anitzazi, which had centered in the San Juan Basin, San Juan Basin up here in northern New Mexico. Now the San Juan Basin uh, and the Anitzazi uh, not only were in San Juan, but also in the Little Colorado area and in the Upper Rio Grande area, and maybe even further west. Um, they were originally pit house dwellers, but quickly turned to building towns of above ground stone houses with black and white pottery. Pottery is very important to archaeologists, as you all know. So I'll throw in the black and white pottery. In the southern part of the American Southwest, in the Gila Salt Valley, and probably running up into the Verde Valley, there's another group called the Hohokam, who were until late times pit house dwellers and the makers of a buffware pottery. In between, in the mountainous area, uh, kind of up around the present day borders of Arizona and New Mexico, the third group called the Mogollon. The Mogollon were originally pit house dwellers, uh, but uh, became builders of stone and mud mortar pueblos like the Anitzazi. 
Uh, and uh, they turned out a series of brown or red wares, uh, simple in a way, but quite distinctive and quite widespread. As time went on, the um, uh, idea there, the, the uh, Mogollon idea was extended on eastward into the Rio Grande Basin uh, to a group called the Eastern uh, Mogollon or the Hornada Mogollon down into the Mimbres area around Deming, New Mexico and uh, then uh, finally in the um, uh, 1950s extended to uh, or even before that extended down into northern Chihuahua, where uh, the, the person who eventually excavated uh, Casas Grandes itself, where he called it the Viejo period, that is the um, uh, old Mogollon period of, the, uh, uh, of that area. Okay, south of the American Southwest and Casas Grandes, whatever it was, uh, there was what they called a great cultural sink, which extended all the way down to the frontiers of Mesoamerica as it existed in Spanish times, just a couple or 300 kilometers north of the Valley of Mexico. Okay, that was the um, idea of the San Juan hypothesis. Now, a second way of viewing the Southwest sort of went back to the older idea of the, uh, uh, of the archaeologists of the 70s and 80s and 90s. And that was uh, to see the Southwest as maybe an appendage of Mesoamerican civilization. In the late 1920s, a Mexican scholar named Miguel O. de Mendizabal uh, pointed out that at the time of the Spanish conquest, this is the 1630s, there was a series of extremely vigorous small states, that's what he called them, estados pequeños, or pequeños estados actually, uh, extending up the west coast of Mexico through my, what's now Nayarit and Sinaloa. And in the late 1920s and then the 1930s, some American archaeologists got interested in this area archaeologically. One was uh, Carl Sauer and his student Donald Brand, who were ge cultural geographers, and an archaeologist, Isabel Kelly, and an ethnographer named Ralph Beals from the University of California, from the University of California, except Isabel Kelly, who I think was not. They investigated these archaeologically, and uh, Sauer gave, called the area Aztatlan, not Aztlan, but Aztatlan. And Donald Brand in the early 30s also explored the northern part of this so-called cultural sink and surveyed a lot of the sites around uh, Casas Grandes, which he called the Chihuahua culture. Shortly later, a short, uh, very short time later, a year or two later, um, Edward B. Sales also explored these sites, and along with uh, Harold Gladwin of Gila Pueblo fame, uh, he, uh, dismissed Casas Grandes as being anything more than just another southwest Mogollon site. Well, it was a lot more than that. 